Okay. Well, welcome everybody and thanks for joining again for, um, for another meeting of the Ozone Bioindicator Garden Network. And um, so I just wanted to today, I, I wanted to have the meeting today mostly to talk about identifying ozone injury because I know that um, we are starting to see it in our gardens here in Colorado and potentially other people are in other locations as well. And so I, I wanted to be able to share what that looks like and answer any questions that anybody might have. Um, and so we'll start with that and then we'll finish with um, a couple of updates from some of our gardens and some of the interns in a few of our gardens. So feel free to ask questions at any point in time, but there will be lots of time for questions at the end as well. And if you don't want to interrupt, feel free to type in the chat box too. Um, so, true. Um, so this is information from our, um, from one of our data collection sheets, the cover sheet. And it just um, identifies that there are, um, okay, can you guys all see my, you can see the presentation. Can you also see the people's pictures on the slide? Okay, I'm just going to um, move that so that I can see my slides. <laughs> um, so stipples are, um, are the main sign that we're looking for when we're looking for ozone damage. And these are dot-like areas that are either tan or red, pur brown, purple, black, that are on the leaf surface. And they're typically on the top leaf surface and are separate and uniform in size, but they can merge to cover larger areas of the leaf surface. And so this is, this is on the front page of our data collection worksheet, um, if, you, if you ever want to go back and reference it. But that's how it starts. And this is um, this potato leaf, that brown spot in the middle. I don't know if people can see my mouse. You can. Okay, this brown spot here, that's the, uh, the start of stippling on the potato leaf. You can also see that there's some spots down here. So this is actually a, an image from this year. And then this is also a little bit more text that I copied out of our, um, our data collection worksheet. And I'll go into this in a little bit more de detail. Um, we need to be careful in our identification of ozone injury because there are things that can mimic ozone injury. And so um, there are a couple of key things to think about when identifying ozone injury. One is that it really only occurs between the leaf veins, not on the veins themselves. Um, most of the injury occurs on the top of the leaf. It's not until later in the season when ozone damage pr gets progressively worse and causes large um, patches of dead tissue that you can see the damage on the bottom surface of the leaf. Um, so older leaves of sensitive plants will show the most damage. And then ozone damage starts as stipple, like I just said, and then with extended exposure, it can mix with leaf yellowing and patches of tissue death, which can make the markings a little less distinct, and sometimes it can be more difficult to diagnose. Um, so really, the best place to find ozone injury is on mature leaves in full sunlight in wet soils. And wet soils matter because the ozone, when it damages the leaf, it needs to get inside the leaf to cause that damage. And if the soils are dry, the leaves are going to have their pores or stomata closed. And so that ozone is not going to get inside the leaf. Um, so the most typical symptom is what I was talking about earlier, which is intervenal stipple on the upper surface of the leaf. Um, so this is, I just put a couple of images here that you can see. This is one from my um, dissertation research. And I just want to highlight that there's, you know, this is, this is actually a plant that has been exposed to higher levels of ozone. I um, blew extra ozone at it in a <clears throat> controlled chamber setting. And so you can see that there's, you know, stipples on the leaf. There's larger areas where the leaf tissue has died and there's some yellowing sort of around that leaf tissue a little bit. But what the other thing that you can see is given that this is pretty severe ozone damage, the veins are standing out really clearly because the ozone damage or the ozone doesn't damage the vein. It's a little harder to see the vein standing out so much up here near the top of the leaf, which doesn't have as much ozone damage in this particular example. The other thing that I want to highlight is if you look at this photo, I was mostly trying to take a photo of this leaf when I took this photo, but you can see in the backgrounds that there are these healthy looking leaves. And that's because this leaf that I took the photo of is an older leaf than some of these newer leaves that don't have the damage. And so the damage develops through time. And so that's um, really something to keep in mind is that you can get damage even this extreme looking uh, on plants when the other leaves of the plants can look perfectly normal. Um, down here is a, I just pulled another image from the um, IPC vegetation website. 
this is of a birch tree and you can see that these stipples are a little bit more discreet. Um, up here they're sort of merging to have larger patches of death, but here you can see that they're a little more discreet through um, the leaf space, but the veins are still not covered, so those still stand out a little bit from the birch leaves. Um, so another thing to keep in mind is that the injury pattern does not initially show on the underside of the leaves and that older leaves will show more injury, which is what I was just trying to highlight here. Um, also, shaded portions of leaves may not show visible injury. So if you have a leaf that's in a shady spot or that is being shaded by another leaf, if one leaf is on top of another, you might not actually see the damage in that portion of the leaf that's shaded by the other leaves. Um, and then the last thing that I just wanted to <clears throat> highlight is that the leaves that have damage may also show signs of premature aging and so the leaves might actually fall off and so they'll have a shorter lifespan if they're more damaged by the ozone and so this is all all of these things are going to depend on the ozone concentrations the environment so how wet it is how sunny it is um, and then uh, and then the sensitivity of the plants and the age of the leaves and so you know depending on the way that the ozone season progresses for you at each of the different gardens, you may or may not see leaves that are getting so damaged that they're falling off early. Um, it just, it's, it's going to depend and it will be a year by year um, difference probably. So um, I wanted to highlight that we do have high ozone concentrations at NCAR and so we do actually see a lot of damage on plants here. Um, this might not be the case for everywhere. And so I just wanted to highlight what our ozone concentrations are. And this is over the past month. So from today, August 12th, back through uh, July 12th. And this line is at the 70 parts per billion, which is the EPA standard. And you have to, EPA regulates something slightly different than the instantaneous or hourly um, 70 parts per billion. But this is just to show that this is where the standard is and that here in Colorado, we exceed this standard regularly. There's actually a lot of news stories out recently with how our air quality um, were getting bumped up to a serious non-attainment standard rather than the moderate that we were at here um, in Colorado's Northern Front Range. So that's been the big local news story. Um, and it's part of the reason why these ozone gardens are kind of fun because we can highlight that you can actually see the visible damage on the plants. So in our gardens, we have four different kinds of plants. And so I'm just gonna go through some images of damage. Um, I didn't put the dates on these, I probably should have, but this is the milkweed plant. And you can see that there's starting of stippling here. This is early on in the growing season. Um, so you can see some of these little dots. And then now much later in the growing season. So in the past two weeks, I've seen damage that looks more like this. So here again, you can see that the veins are standing out on this leaf this milkweed leaf, um, but there's large areas where the, the leaf is has um, the black spots that is caused by the ozone damage. And so this is starting to become larger patches of cell death here in these black spots. And so that's what ozone damage can look like on the milkweed. Um, on coneflower, the damage looks a little bit different and it's, um, it tends to be smaller and it tends to not um, turn as continuous. Um, but both of these are images, and I put both of these up here. So this um, image on the right here is from a container garden that we have in the back of NCAR on our cafeteria patio, and the leaves tend to be not as dark green because I think they're in container boxes and not planted in the ground, whereas the leaf here on the left is actually from the front garden and it's planted directly in the ground, and it's a darker green, and it's actually much harder to see the spots on the darker green leaves, but they exist. And so this, this image, you can actually start to see all of these spots here. Um, they're more easily, it's more easily identified on this lighter green leaf over here where you can really see those dark spots coming through. And so both of these are examples of ozone damage. You can see, you know, stippling, pretty relatively widespread stippling on both of these leaves. Um, and it starts off, you know, just as smaller numbers of dots, and then the dots grow progressively more and more. And so um, just even looking between these two plants, I think gives you a sense for why I particularly like to have data collected on different kinds of plants is because they can tell us different things. And so the cone flower just accumulates more and more stipples usually 
rather than, ha um, at least in our environment here, rather than having larger um, patches of death, which is what we started to see on the milkweed were those larger patches of death um, or dead areas on the leaves. And so they can tell us different things and, and these spots can progressively increase and the tissue, the areas of tissue death can progressively increase through time. And so trying to connect those to what the ozone concentrations are, I think um, is a really important thing so that we have a sense for when the ozone damage starts to occur on different kinds of plants and you can use different species of plants together to really say something about the ozone environment because if the damage um, on the coneflower is at a certain point but the damage on the milkweed is at a different point, that can tell you something about your ozone environment um, in the area. And so that's one of the things that I'm really trying to figure out with the, um, with the data collection at these ozone gardens. Um, so here's some images of the sensitive snap bean. This image on the right is a little bit out of focus. I'm sorry about that, but you can see that there's a lot of stipple and there's, um, you know, sort of larger sections of, of dead tissue on this particular leaf as well. Um, this here is not ozone damage, but all of these brown spots, the dark brown spots are ozone damage. Um, and this, typically in these leaves, I actually, I just heard word today, but I didn't have a chance to go take a photo that like now about 90% of the leaves on the snap bean plants look like this. And then these areas start to turn yellow as well pretty quickly. But just last week, I think, is when I took this picture. So you can see that a lot of these leaves are pretty healthy looking. And then you have this, um, this one leaf down here that is starting to develop the ozone damage. And so progressively increasing damage through time, um, the sensitive snap bean tends to have a um, more of a threshold response where the, the damage does start to occur at a certain point, but it goes from very low damage to very high damage over a very short period of time. And so that's, to me, it's interesting, when does that threshold occur and what are the ozone, what's the ozone environment leading up to that point and, um, and how quickly does that occur? So those are, those are the kinds of things that I think are really interesting. Um, on the potato, I guess maybe I only included one example here, but you can see on the leaves these dark patches of the brown stipple. Here, um, the stippling on the potato and on the um, snap bean tend to be larger spots than what you see on um, for initially for the milkweed and also for the coneflower. Those stipples are much, much smaller than what you start to see on the potato. So you can see that there's stippling um, throughout the potato leaves and so, some of the leaves at this point look um, really, really damaged and have, you know, are mostly brown right now. Um, but I guess I didn't include any of those images. <laughs> um, just to give you sort of a sense, there are things that are not ozone damage. Um, there's an alternaria that um, can affect potato leaves and I have actually also seen alternaria and ozone damage both on our um, on, our, on leaves and our plants in the ozone garden. And so this is a fungal pathogen that affects leaves and it can cause these weird looking um, patches of, of cellular death. And so that, or of, of leaf death, I should say. It's beyond cellular level, it's, it's more leaf level. So you see lar larger patches of um, dead tissue. And over here, this is on a maple leaf, but um, I get a lot of questions from the public about, you know, oh, I see these dark spots on my leaf. And oftentimes they're talking about something that looks more like this, which is um, called leaf spot. And this is also a fungal infection. This occurs on a lot of trees in a lot of places. So you have different things, um, whether or not it's insect damage or leaf spot damage or some other fungal um, pathogen that can affect leaves. And so it's just um, important to sort of point out that these other things do exist that can look like ozone damage and that general public can think are ozone damage but are not in fact um, what we know of to be as ozone damage. Um, so I guess that's, those are all the images that I have um, for the time being. And I just wanted to highlight um, a few new things, which is exciting. So the first is that we are working on a website for data collection. Um, I currently have this website. It's not searchable from Google, but if you have the link, you can use it. I am prototyping this um, this summer at NCAR to make sure that all of the database and infrastructure work and to try and get it sort of up to speed. 
it's it's pretty basic right now. It's basically the data collection worksheets in a web form so that you can enter it directly. I'm hoping that over the course of the next year, we're going to add some um, training options so that people can walk through on their own what is and is not ozone exam um, ozone damage, including a lot of photo examples. And I'm hoping that we can add data visualization. I'm hoping that we have this already by next summer, so that this so the data collection actually becomes much easier. Um, I know that it's not easy in the current web platform to uh, record mobily, and so I know that that's been a challenge. But um, I'm hoping that this is this is off the ground. We are currently um, we're just starting to work with C Boulder's computer science students. They have a senior practicum, and so uh, they do projects for people. And so this is going to be one of the projects is to really develop out this website. So I'm also interested in hearing more from what you would all like um, on a website for the network um, that could be informative and hopefully um, over the course of the next winter and spring um, you can take a look at a couple of our prototype examples and see if there are other suggestions that you have as I work with these students to develop the, the website. Um, and then I just also wanted to highlight there were interns at a couple different of the gardens this year. So this is a, um, a picture of Rebecca Holmes at the Virginia Living Museum. So it's here on the left. And she was an intern there for the summer. She's actually an undergraduate at CU Boulder. Um, and I'm hoping that she will stay involved with the Ozone Garden Project. But her uh, internship project this year was to develop techniques to get museum guests engaged in citizen science data collection. And so this is, um, I pulled this information from her slides. She just gave this talk on Friday and I think finished her internship on Friday. And so her goals were to um, educate folks, to collect data, and then she also um, concluded and wrapped up with them. So she provided a bunch of background information on the Ozone Garden and also on NASA's TEMPO mission. Um, and then she helped guests collect data from the garden. And so she, she included things beyond just looking at the ozone injury as the stipple on the garden. So she did things like plant height, leaf width and length, soil and air temperature. <clears throat> and then she also did try to get them to look at her stipples as well, but she, um, she said that they didn't actually see any signs of ozone damage on the plants as of yet at the Virginia Living Museum. So um, the ozone concentrations there probably were not as high as here. I don't have um, direct access or easy access to those data, so I'm not um, sure what the ozone concentrations were there, but it seems likely that they were not as high. Um, and then she would always try and conclude with her guests um, to end with some sort of conservation message. Um, and she put together a list of pros and cons. Um, she was able to create the interactive and educational tool that allowed citizens to engage in science. She saw a lot of excitement and enthusiasm. She had a wide range of ages from toddlers through adults um, that participated in her citizen science. Um, and she also felt like they gained experience in, um, in, and she saw, I guess, through her education, scientific literacy among the public, and so that was exciting for her. Um, she had a couple of things that were not so good, which one of being the heat, she said, was often unbearable for her and for the guests. The weather also didn't always cooperate. I guess it could be rainy some days. Um, and also the data is limited because the citizen scientists didn't always want to use every tool that they had available. And so her number one suggestion for us in order to get um, more of the ozone damage data collected at, the, at these gardens is to include displays that feature citizen science data so that the guests at the museums or at any of the gardens can see the data that they collect and also um, the bigger project that they're contributing to. And so leading on to that, um, Erica had an intern working with her this summer who was working on um, displaying ozone garden data and, and how to do this. And so this is part of what I'm hoping we can incorporate into the app this next year. And Erica, since um, Emmanuel was your intern, maybe you would like to say something about Absolutely. this. Absolutely. And he's actually in the room here with me as well. Oh. Well, hi, Emmanuel. <laughs> hey, hi, hi, everybody. Hello. How are you guys doing? <laughs> uh, so Emmanuel is helping us think about how we can display some of this data uh, for visitors to start engaging with it. Obviously, they're not going to be looking at the data in the same way that Donica is for the Citizen Science Project. Uh, that takes 
deeper analysis, but for a first level of just being able to compare what are, what are the species doing on that um, basic level of, are you seeing things, one plant have ozone injury more early on? Is it growing faster? Some of those things that Donica was talking about. Um, so I'm actually gonna, if you don't mind, Donica, take a two seconds and take the screen myself because I'm gonna show you guys the tool that he's been using. Yeah, um, how do I unshare? Uh, I might just be able to. I think I can just steal it. Oh, here, stop share. There we go. Okay. Let's see if I pick the right one. Did I pick the right one? Yeah. You've seen something that has a big spreadsheet? Yes. Awesome. Uh, so Emmanuel did some research with us and we started working with this tool called Kodak. Uh, it's designed by a Concord consortium. It's designed for data uh, display and data analysis. It's designed to make it easier for naive people to start exploring. Uh, and seeing what data can actually tell you. So he's built this first round. Um, I actually have two versions here that I'm gonna flip back and forth. Uh, what you're seeing here is actually the data he collected in our gardens this summer. Uh, and one of the things he was trying to think about for users, and we'd love feedback on this, is that not all gardens are gonna be just one collector like Emmanuel was. So Emmanuel has one person collecting all the data, you know, so that's gonna be 10 leaves every day. Obviously at most of these gardens, that's not going to be the case. There's going to be one day where there's 60 pieces of data and another where there's just the 10. Um, and so he started to think about that a little bit. I'm just going to show you real quick what his, his display looks like right now. So you can actually see this here. And one of the great things about CodeApp is you can actually play around with, thing, with your attributes pretty quickly. Um, so right now he's got date time versus average injury. Um, but, and the plant species as the color variation in the center there. Um, but the tool, why am I not scrolling properly here? Um, so one of the things we were playing around with, which just to see if it changed anything you can, was summer injury. So like if you counted up the different levels, would that be anything different? And you can just drag and drop that onto the graph and it'll change the display for you. Um, so you can, it's really, easy for someone to kind of manipulate the graphs or create a new graph um, with a lot, add a lot of work. And so I'm just gonna real quick. Can, I, can I say something really quick? Because I, I just want to also highlight, you know, that you do have the data here and we are seeing interesting results, you know, um, in addition to going into the, the details of this um, visualization, I, I think it's nice to sort of see that we have, let's see, it's the snap beans that are in pink are showing the, the highest level of injury right now mm -hmm. um, in your garden. And then the potato are showing some injury as well. And the coneflower is showing the least amount of injury. And so that's, I, I just think that that's interesting in the fact that you can actually track the injury through time and, and see that and see that it seems like the snap beans are the most sensitive. Um, and they were showing higher signs of injury earlier on, but it seems like they really ramped up, whereas the other two plants more increased more, much more slowly. Absolutely, right, yeah. So this is a great way to start seeing some of those comparisons. Um, and one of the things that, so this is, this next one that I've just switched to is um, not real data. This is just uh, <laughs> sample data to see what it might look like. And one of the things that we wanted to play around with in this particular graph you can see here is a comparison of what might be a trained staff member uh, versus a citizen data, right? So you can compare how somebody who's really eager to see the ozone injury might see something a little differently. You know, it might, might not look like this. They might have lower measurements, but it's something you can look at um, pretty easily by dragging and dropping once he's built this great, um, chart for us, this table takes a little time thinking about the logic of it, but now that it's built, it's a lot easier to kind of drag and drop and compare um, and have lots of data from one day to another. Um, so our hope is to have a way for all gardens to have access to these, um, to, well, create versions of this for now. Um, we also want to work with Donica to make it so it's interfaced more easily with the data collection so that you're not having to put the data in two separate places. Um, but this is a pretty mobile friendly, it can be used on a tablet. So what's great is you can have this data display and bring it out to the garden and show folks as they're adding data that day. Um, fingers crossed we'll figure out how to uh, <laughs> add it into the website. It is, the good news is uh, CodeApp is designed to be embedded in other websites, so. Great.
Um, yeah, so I think that that's all, all that we have to show you for today, just the, the new tools that we're developing and also the injury itself. Um, and so I wanted to open it up to questions from anyone if, um, or concerns or, or thoughts. And while we do that, I'm just going to drag in. I have a couple sets of photos from some gardens that shared them with me just to, so we can kind of get a comparison of what other folks are doing. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think Guan Yu's on the line, but this is a garden at Spelman College, um, right in the center of campus. Uh, so they're working on getting some new signs. And one of the things that with, with Tempo, this is a Tempo supported garden. So some signage that connects the garden to that work that's being done. Uh, and they are collecting uh, data as well on their gardens. And I'm sure I can get you these photos afterwards too, Donica. Yeah, thanks. And it looks like you have one more slide below that. I do. And then I have some photos from the Children's Museum in New Hampshire. Um, they don't see, they indicated, uh, Coley indicated that they haven't been noticing much injury up there. Although when I was looking, and I'm actually going to zoom in and present this because I want you to take a look at this. <laughs> I think maybe if I don't zoom in, it might be easier. There was a couple spots on the backs of these leaves. Hold on. That might be the earliest stages, and I think if I do it this way. There are a couple little spots that are starting to look like they might soon be injury. It's hard to tell for me on an image. Yeah, very well could be. Yeah, it's, a little, it's, it's a little hard to tell, but yeah. Yeah, if I can look at the some of the higher resolution images as well, I might be able to. Absolutely. The so snap bean, the snap bean and the potato do seem to um, develop injury that is more visible more easily than some of the than some of the other plants, um, and they both seem to have more of a threshold response. And, and again, the more data that we can collect on this, the more the easier it is to quantify. Um, so that's <laughs> that's always helpful. And one thing that I'm just remembering that when I um, talked to Emmanuel actually earlier. Um, last week or the week before, he had asked me um, about collecting data when there was no damage on the plant. And what I said to him, and, and something that I always forget to remind people, is that that is still useful information because no ozone damage is it, still useful information given whatever the ozone environment that you're in. It's not enough to cause ozone damage. And so to me, that is still useful because then we know that concentrations um, and accumulated concentrations up until that time were not enough to um, to induce ozone damage on these types of plants. So to me, that is still useful even if even if you're not seeing the damage. It's a great point. Lack of injury is still data, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, was there anybody else that had some images that they wanted to share? I do have some images if you're yeah absolutely some data from our from our garden if you want to see that i'd be happy to just share my screen and then is that okay absolutely let me figure out how to stop sharing my screen i seem to have lost that moment i found it as a button at the top yes normal my normal buttons are missing for a second ah there it is <laughs> all right so i think you should be able to ask to share your screen yes hold on here we go. So um, just a couple of pictures from our garden. So we are right next to a road, but we're in the middle of central South Dakota. So um, our year this year is a little different than the others. So we have those raised garden beds in the back of our uh, museum. And you can see our signs that we have out there with some of the potato, the bean and the tobacco that we have in the back. And in the front of the garden, we have milkweed and coneflower in our butterfly garden. So I have, that's just a little where our boxes are. And we have four plants of each variety of um, snap bean and potato. And then we have two each of the tobacco and then one cornflower and one milkweed in the front. Um, so this is kind of, and we are we're collecting the data from each plant individually. So that's actually one of the things that I'm hoping that when you have a new site for data collection that we can keep track of it. Because I think, I mean, it's nice to see the overall, but if we collect the data 
from every plant individually, it's kind of nice to be able to keep track of it and not lose that input that we have. Um, so right now where we're at with our ozone damage assessment is um, we have nine tobacco leaves total that have damage, six potato and 30 beans. Um, so this is where we're at right now. And um, one of our interns that been, that's been doing the data collection has put together that nice observation chart of the index number of ozone damage. So how much damage per leaf do they actually show? And you can see that the beans, first of all, obviously have the most damage, but they also have the most severest the severest damage, they're also already in index four mm -hmm. um, versus the other ones that don't have as much. So, and obviously the only where we can actually see the, the damage or the ozone sensitives, we don't have any damage on the other ones. And there's no damage so far on our milkweed and coneflower. So nothing there, all the damages in the other sensitive, specifically the sensitive varieties of the other plants. So this is what our injury looks like. Just a couple of examples on a tobacco. I think the potato is kind of at the upper end of the leaf. It's kind of hard to tell. The bean is the easiest to see. Um, and you can also see that there is some potential other damage going on um, yeah. in between. So kind of exactly what you said, right? There might be some things that um, at one point are either ozone damage that's really tough to tell because they're not as distinct yeah. and other things that might happen at the same time. Yep. So we, we are trying to be very careful in being sure that we are only reporting what, what we need to and what, what is correct here. So um, I do have a couple of pictures just to see some of the damage that we have and ask what that might be. So the tobacco, as you can see, apart from the um, stippling has those white dots, which I'm assuming are bugs. The potato also has some, some white spots on them and the potatoes. So all of those I think might be from a similar thing and we just didn't know what it was. And so we thought we can ask if you guys know what that happened to be. Um, yeah, there might be some leaf hopper, you know, on the tobacco, it, I believe that um, sometimes the ozone damage does show up as whitish spots. Oh. Um, and I, I'll have to look back. I don't have the um, tobacco, the images of tobacco damage in my, in, in my brain <laughs> right now. And so I'll have to look back at some photos because the damage can look quite different on different types of plants. Sure. Um, but it does, it looks like, you know, maybe there could be some like leaf hopper or leaf miner mm -hmm. um, damage. I mean, clearly you also have chewed out um, sections of your leaf. Oh yeah, that, that happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then the white spots on the on the top of the potato are not ozone damage, like you're right. saying. Um, and I, I would guess that those are some sort of leaf miner or leaf hopper insect. Um, and on the tobacco, I'll I'll get back to you because I did see. Awesome. I'll um, I, I it might be it might be more brown usually, but I I think that sometimes you can see damage almost whitish in color. And I would say, um, so maybe the smaller whitish spots, but the larger areas where you have the sort of larger um, tissue damage is probably not ozone. And even the white spots might also be a, a leaf miner. Often they sort of dig out the top surface of the leaf and mm -hmm. leave like whitish patches. Yeah. Um, and when I, I just go back, so that tobacco, that oh, clearly yeah. has dark, yeah, it has darker spots. Yeah, so you're so yeah, that's probably more of what the damage should look like. That's what I figured. Yeah. So you know, this is our second year. With I think we're getting better in <laughs> figuring out what it is exactly. And yeah. the interesting part is last year we only we did not have any damage on our tobacco leaves. So this is the first year that we actually do see ozone damage on them. Okay. So definitely there is something different this year. And one of the big differences when you mentioned the moist soil we had a drought last year and we have flooding and rain like crazy this year yeah so I wonder if that makes a difference there yeah I um I imagine that it does and so there it can be multiple things one is that when you do have a drought the plant the pores on the leaves they close and so the ozone doesn't get inside the leaves as much and so that's part of um that's part of what causes less damage in drought years um, then in wetter years when the pores can be more open and so they interact, the plant leaves interact with the air more often. 
Um, but then also you could have different ozone environments. And so I don't know, you know, if you've had a chance to, to assess what the ozone concentrations were last year compared to this year. So I think all of those things will sure. matter. Um, and if you, if you don't know of a nearby monitor, I can try and help you look for the nearest EPA monitor um, to see That'd be what great. Yeah. concentrations were. And actually, so that is actually one of the other projects that Emmanuel has been working on for us is uh, writing up a simple instruction sheet on how to find your local monitor oh, great. Uh, and get that data so that it's something, it's a little difficult. It's not super hard, but you know, you do have to know what you're looking for. So he's been helping us create a nice one or two page document on how to do that. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing here, but that's that's from our side here, and I'm kind of excited because things change, and it's, yeah, it's a cool experience. Like Donica and I were saying earlier, oh, we get excited when there's ozone injury. Like, <laughs> you feel really bad, but you're like, oh, look at the injury, and then you're like, oh, wait. <laughs> right, and one of my colleagues, she went out there, and she's like, this looks terrible. Last year, it wasn't that bad. I don't want to breathe anymore here. Don't, don't yeah. show me that. So, yeah. Are there other questions or um, thoughts or concerns, <laughs> suggestions? Or feedback on the website or data collection. Uh, those are all greatly appreciated as well. Hi, everybody. This is Emmy Fogger Quinn at Park Service. Um, right now, uh, I only have um, permission to view the website, and so I think that might be why like the forum is still empty. Is that if we all only have view access, we can't actually write to each other there. Oh. Oh, let me, I did not realize that. You should have access, full access. I will look into that um, for the Moodle you're talking about, right? Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the website on, um, I think so. The It's hosted by is it CFA maybe? Yeah, yeah, I will look into that because you should have access to write on the forums and if you don't, I've done something wrong so I can fix that. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. This is, this is Jane Metcalf um, from Arlington and we have not started our garden yet but I had a couple questions for those who have. Um, one is, does anybody, we were thinking about getting a portable ozone monitor to be able to monitor kind of throughout the season. Does anybody, is anybody doing that? And do you think that would be helpful? Yeah, so um, Margaret Pippin has been working on finding an affordable ozone monitor that actually produces valuable data. Mm -hmm. um, she has not yet found one she loves. There's a couple that are reasonably priced um, that that she has indicated work pretty well, um, but her students have actually been uh, evaluating monitors for okay. the past couple of years. Um, so hopefully, I think I'm hoping by the time this year we'll have some better information for folks about monitors that are re they're still expensive. Yeah. Like the cheap ones don't work. Um, Okay. Uh, yeah, there's been a few that have come out that Margaret got really excited about, the, you know, this, you know, 100 to 200 dollar range ones and they just aren't um, very accurate, aren't accurate uh, or consistent. So, um, okay. so, but that is like, that is Margaret's mission. Okay. <laughs> she is, she is determined to find a monitor that um, folks can, can use and mm -hmm afford, you know, manage to get for their gardens, because it will add to the data that we're collecting. Um, yeah, and it would, it, I mean, I would, if you can, I would love to encourage you all to get ozone monitors, but I realize um, they are not cheap. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yes, Margaret, as Erica said, Margaret has been working on that. And in the interim, um, what I have been sort of recommending to people is trying to contact, there's a company called 2B, and their ozone monitors are pretty reliable. They're, um, they have a couple different kinds. They have ones that are called the portable monitor that you just walk around with. Um, so they're portable, but they do run out of battery, so you have to recharge them. And then they have more of a stationary monitor that's a bigger, it's a box that's maybe this big, and then this, 
this tall, mm -hmm. um, about those dimensions. Um, and th those are, they're pretty reliable and sometimes they will sell refurbished units. And so you can get in touch with them, um, tell them, you can even tell them that you're working with the Ozone Garden Network um, if you want and, and give them my name and see if they have anything that is refurbished that they can help you out with. Um, those might still run, you know, $5,000 or something like that. Oh, cool. Yeah, so they're, <laughs> yeah. they're quite expensive. Um, but you can, you, you know, you can always contact and ask <laughs> and see what they have and see if they have anything um, and tell them what it's for and how you'll be using it and whether or not you'll display the data and they might be able to um, help you figure something out if they have something. But that's, that's one of the more reliable monitors that I know of at this point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, they're still quite expensive compared to um, some of these cheaper options that we've been looking into, but they're just not, the cheaper options we found either, um, they don't, at least from what I understand from Margaret's work so far, they don't last long term or they get constant maintenance and end up costing almost as much anyway because mm -hmm. you're paying for constant maintenance, so. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a better. <laughs> oh no, no, I didn't realize. And we were thinking more portable monitor, just because we don't want to leave anything there. Yeah. yeah. Well, they do have the the two B does have the portable ones. I don't know how much those run. Yeah. I do think that you can lease them. Actually, I think that they have a program where you can like rent them for a period of time. And some Margaret sometimes has some that she can lend out to folks, but you have to be engaging groups in certain ways. Um, so I can I can talk to Margaret more about how we can get gardens okay. monitors because I do think that would be valuable to the project. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it, somebody just popped up in the chat saying that the two B the portable ozone monitor is also about five thousand um, dollars. I, the last that I had talked to them, they did try, they were trying to have a program where you could rent them for a certain period of time. Um, and so I, I haven't checked on the status of that because that's not what I've been using here, but yeah. But you have one at, at um, NCAR? I do. I have a, a 2B, just a stationary refurbished monitor here at NCAR. And so that's the um, ozone concentrations when I was showing those, the, the all this dots in green, that was um, those were the NCAR ozone data that we're collecting. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Other questions or thoughts? Um, before we close up the meeting? Can, um, I can also try and check in with Margaret and see if she can give us an update on the info for the ozone monitors and maybe that's something that we can um, get to garden sometime this winter to start to think about. Um, oh yeah, and Kathy Reagan just wrote in and said that they have air quality monitor kits at the University of Colorado Museum that are available to rent for $10 a week, but they don't usually do long-term rentals. So maybe that's another place to check. I know that there's some folks at CU Boulder that have been working on, um, that I think Kathy has been working with, that have been working on um, developing some of the, some new ozone monitor um, capabilities. And so they've been trying to also make lower cost instruments. Um, I know it's Mike Hannigan's lab at CU Boulder that has been working on that. And I know that Kathy has been working with him. More possibilities that we can add to the list. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I guess if people don't have other um, information or, or questions or anything, um, we can wrap up a few minutes early, but thank you all for coming and attending and asking your questions and being engaged. Um, and I guess one last question I have for everyone is, uh, do you have other things that would be helpful to discuss in a meeting format? Um, you know, I know that the ozone garden season is probably gonna be wrapping up in about a month. Um, and just wondering if anybody has sort of requests for topics for next meetings or, um, or anything related to that. 
I think it would be nice to just hear from the other sites what kind of programs they do around it with their, you know, if it's not just a data collection, but if they embed it into programs for kids and adults, um, kind of kind of see best practices and on what worked and in what capacity. Okay. Yeah, and I'd love to see some, I'm going to fix the Moodle. Uh, <laughs> so I would love to see conversations happening there as well. If folks are doing activities or want feedback on some of the activities that you're doing. Um, I would love to see questions and things in those forums. So I'll make sure that that's working. Uh, yeah, great. Um, yeah, oh. so maybe, maybe we could have a sort of in, in the fall of sort of wrap up to the season and, and hear from different locations about what worked and what didn't work throughout the summer. Um, and then maybe we'll after that, we can take a break for a little while throughout the winter and, and then reconvene starting late winter, early spring to talk about ramping up and problems that people may have. And Donica, I don't know if you see the chat that there's, there is one more thing here about how to store plant material over the winter. So oh, right. in the spring, well, that is a great point. How to put the gardens to bed. Hmm. Yes. Sure. I didn't see that. Um, Okay. Yeah, we can we can do that for uh, another meeting in another month or so. Um, yeah, Mid September might be a good time for the meeting. But yeah, also if you if any if any of the gardens have any um, publicity or you know anything, please share. <laughs> it's always exciting for me to see. Um, and if you missed it, I think um, I said earlier today that I just found out that there was a story that came out of in the Colorado Sun about our ozone garden here in Boulder. Um, so <laughs> that's, you know, those kinds of things I think are fun for me to, to share and to keep track of. Have those. Wow. All right. Well, Thank you, everyone. I'll let you all go and get on with your day, but I appreciate you taking the time to be here for this meeting. And uh, if you have any questions before the next meeting, please don't hesitate to let us know. Thank you. Thank yeah. you all.